All right. Uh, time flies on these weekends. Ooh, okay, we're already to the third lesson. All right. Um, you know, I, I do want to say this. Uh, I hope that as, especially as we go through this lesson, um, I hope that you understand, and this is so true, I am truly just one beggar telling other beggars where to find the bread. I tell people that sums up my book right there. Uh, last year I was at a church and a lady came up at the break and she said, you know, she said, uh, when you teach, I feel like I'm in your kitchen and you're just talking to me. And I remember I just teared up. I went, that's the sweetest thing anybody's ever said to me. Um, and so I want you all to feel that way. You're just in my kitchen. And I am telling you how the Lord has helped me in the struggles in my life. And I know he will help you too. So that sums it up. Let's look at our uh, last praise passage. So take your, take your booklet. And this one, this is one of my favorites. I don't think there is anything in Scripture that surpasses the picture of worship that we are given in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Um, and if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and take it out and turn to Revelation chapter 4 and follow along as I read these verses. Uh, very briefly, as you know, the events of the end time are being revealed in the book of Revelation to the Apostle John. But before God tells him about all these events that are coming, it tells us that the Apostle John was transported in the Spirit to the throne room. He's in heaven. He is being shown a vision in heaven where God is. And so in chapter 4 of Revelation, John begins to try to describe what he's seeing. And he's really, at, it's kind of funny, he's at a loss for words. He doesn't even know how to describe things because he's never seen anything like this before. He talks about the four living creatures that are flying around. He talks about the 24 elders, and we understand that to represent the church. That represents the body of Christ. And so I want you to understand here in Revelation 4 and 5, if you know Christ, someday you will be here. Okay, this is talking about you because the elders represent the body of Christ. Now, in chapter 4, we find two hymns of praise that are primarily worshiping God as the creator. That is what the focus is. Then we move to chapter 5, and we find three more hymns of praise in chapter 5. And these are focused on Jesus Christ as the great redeemer of men. So I am going to start reading in chapter 5, and I'm going to try and set the stage for what is happening. And then I'm going to have you come in and join in reading on, chapter, on verse 11. So let's start with verse 1. I saw in him, I saw in the right hand of him, who sat on the throne, and that is God the Father, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And the commentators pretty much agree that this book represents the ownership of this earth. It's the title deed to the, own, to the earth that shows ownership. And I, verse 2, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals. And no one in heaven on, or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. So in verse number two, the angel cries out, who is worthy? And there is silence in heaven because no one is worthy. Romans chapter three tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. And so 
John begins to cry. And you know, I don't think he's crying just because no one can open the book. I think he's actually crying for what sin has done to this world since Adam and Eve fell in the gardens. Think of all the unspeakable amount of heartache down through the ages, the sadness and the sorrow of life, the countless tears that have been cried throughout human history, the sickness and the pain and the wars and the death. And it's just overwhelming. I think John is really thinking of all that. And so he, he's overwhelmed with grief and he is crying because no one is worthy. But then look at verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Stop crying, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And for those of us who love the Chronicles of Narnia, how can you not think of Aslan, the great lion in those stories? He's talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so the elder says, John, stop crying. There is one worthy. There is only one, but there is one. And so John turns to see this great lion. But what does he see? He sees a little lamb as if it had been slain. But this lamb is alive and it is crowned with power and majesty. And so in verse 7, John watches as the lamb moves to the throne and takes the book out of the right hand of him who sits on the throne, and everyone begins to fall down before the Lamb. Ladies, we need to understand this scene in Revelation 5 is the culmination of all human history. All of time is marching steadily to this moment. Everything has come down to this. And we, along with the saints of all the ages, we are there to see it. We are there to witness it. The worthy one, the lamb, is about to take back what is rightfully his. And finally, sin and death and Satan are about to be defeated forever. This should thrill our souls, ladies. The Lord, in his mercy, has given us so much beauty, so many things to enjoy in this world, but they all pale in comparison to this. Colossians 3, that we mentioned earlier, it tells us to set our minds on thing, things above this world, but we at times, get so enamored with earthly things. We get so caught up in this world that we forget what lies ahead. And those earthly things that distract us so much, in the end, they will not matter, okay? So if you belong to Christ today, if you know the Lord, I am challenging you, don't Go get so busy, so involved, so distracted with the things of this world that you never take the time to focus on what is waiting for us. All right, verse 8. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, every tongue, every people and nation. So everyone is beginning to praise Jesus Christ. 
So when the lamb takes that book, heaven begins to explode in worship. First, the elders, the church, falls down, sings the new song, and then the angels, a vast, un, uncountable number of angels begin to join in and say, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. And then in verse 13, the whole creation begins to erupt in praise because it knows finally it's about to be redeemed. It says, every animal, every bird, fish, rock, plant, every tree. Uh, Isaiah 55 says, the mountains and the hills will shout for joys and the trees will clap their hands. Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And that is exactly what we see here in Revelation 5, the entire creation is praising its creator. And remember, if you belong to Christ, if you truly know him, you are here. Okay, you're in this scene. You know when you go to the mall and you're, you know, you see those maps and, you know, there's always a little diamond or little thing and it says, you are here, okay? Okay. I'm telling you, you are here, okay? We are in this chapter. And so we're going to read this together, and we're going to consider it a dress rehearsal, okay? Because we will say it again someday. So I want you to join me with verse 11 and read this aloud. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. All right, let's pray. Oh Lord, our hearts are so full as we read this. What a scene we see here in the book of Revelation, just all of creation praising the creator. And so, Lord, we do worship you. We fall at your feet. Lord, your greatness is unsearchable, and we can hardly even imagine what this will be like, but it is told to us in your word, and we know it is true, and we know someday we will be doing this together. We will be praising you. So thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us, your kindness. And I pray as we conclude this last lesson, again, I ask that you would bless every lady here. Lord, help her to just grab on to your word, that your word would give her strength, that give her joy and encouragement and hope. And we thank you just that you have given us your precious word. Lord, I pray that we would be teachable, that we would listen to your voice. And especially I pray for the ladies here that are wrestling with uh, great trials, great sorrow, great suffering, suffering. And I do pray that you would be today their comfort as we talk about what it means to trust you. Help me as I teach. Guard my words. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. As we start, um, like I said, if I can only teach one lesson, this is the one I teach. And it's basically the last chapter in the book just expanded a little bit. I wrote this letter, this lesson many, many years ago. And uh, it started with a conversation that I had with my husband. Uh, he did a great deal of counseling when we were at the church in Los Angeles. And he was talking one night, and he, he was just 
thinking about this. He said, you know, everyone that comes in to me for counseling has exactly the same problem. Now, it can take a thousand different forms, but it's the same problem. They are having difficulty trusting God in some area of their lives, in some situation. And I just kept thinking about that, and I realized that at the very heart of the Christian life is the issue of trust. Okay, when we get saved, we put our trust in Christ for our salvation. And yet difficulty in trusting God seems to be the universal problem. I don't know of a person who has never struggled in this area. And this lesson has definitely come out of my own journey. And believe me, I am still learning. I feel that I have barely scratched the surface when it comes to this issue of trusting God. But through his word, the Lord has really helped me. And today, I will share a few personal illustrations, only because some of the deepest lessons I've ever learned in my life have come through the darkest times of my life. And as I talk about these things today, please understand, I do not do it lightly. There is great sorrow and great suffering and great heartache in this world. And many of you have gone through things that I have not. And even when you know that God is in control, sometimes there are still no easy answers. And I would say really this is the, the challenge, if you want to sum it up. The challenge of the Christian life is dealing with the issues of trials and suffering and the heartaches in life that we sometimes go through. We have to understand that suffering is inevitable. In Job 5, 7, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. James chapter 1, count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. James did not say if. He said when. He knew it was coming. First Peter, Peter says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Peter's saying, don't be surprised. Um, we had a pastor many, many years back in, uh, ago back in Texas, and he loved to say this. Let me show you a picture of the Christian life. Here's the Christian life. You have either just come through a trial, or you are in a trial right now, or you are about to be in a trial, okay? That's very accurate. That is the Christian life. We must learn to see our trials as Paul did in 2 Corinthians 12, where he's talking about the thorn in the flesh. And in those verses, he says he was well content with his suffering. He said, I am well pleased with my suffering how could he say that? I mean, how often do we say that? Ooh, I am well content with my suffering. I, boy, I love this suffering. How could Paul say that? Well, for one thing, don't forget, this is the same guy that wrote Romans 8.28. Okay, he knew that when he was weak, God was strong. He knew that no matter what he went through, God would use it for good in his life. And so he could say that. So we must learn to have that attitude when we confront the suffering in our lives. Now, how many of you, um, you can raise your hand if you want, how many of you have at some point read the book Trusting God by Jerry Bridges? Okay, plenty of you, great. Okay, the rest of you, uh, when you go home today, I want you to go on the internet and order that book, okay? You need to get that book and read that book, Trusting God. That was a life-changing book for me uh, several decades ago. It, I had always struggled so much to trust God, and that book had a profound impact on me, and I've heard that from other people. I, am, I have based this lesson very loosely on 
some of the points that Jerry Bridges makes in his book. What he says in that book, he says, there are two aspects of trusting God. The first one is, can I trust God? In other words, is God trustworthy? Number two, can I trust God? In other words, do I have such a relationship with God that I believe he is with me when I see no evidence of it? Okay, so we're going to look at those two questions. We will look at the first one, which I'm calling the trustworthiness of God, which is the question, is God worthy of my trust? Jerry says in his book that if you're going to learn to trust God, there are three essential truths about God you must believe. The first truth is this, God is completely sovereign. Now, God's sovereignty is a subject I get more and more passionate about, I think, with every year that passes. The Bible is absolutely full of scriptures that affirm the sovereignty of God. Genesis 50, 20, this is Joseph speaking, okay? Joseph went through great suffering, and when he's talking to his brothers who had sinned against him so badly, He's talking to them, and he says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, and they did. When they threw him in that pen, uh, pit, they meant evil, but God meant it for good. That's kind of like the Old Testament equivalent of Romans 8, 28. God takes everything, sin, everything bad, and he turns it to good. God is sovereign over everything. Uh, Job 42.2, Job talking, I know you can do everything and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Nothing God wants to do can be stopped. Psalm 103, uh, this is, if you like to memorize scripture, that's another wonderful uh, psalm to memorize. Psalm 103, great psalm of praise. It said, his sovereignty rules over all, okay, over everything in the universe. He rules over it all. Psalm 115, our God is in the heavens. He does what he pleases. There is incredible comfort in these verses, and I've given you many more to look up. There is such comfort here. We live, ladies, in a broken, sinful, fallen world. But when you are a child of God, there are no accidents in your life. If I thought all the heartaches of my life were just random accidents that God had nothing to do with, that would lead me to total despair. But understanding God's sovereignty makes all the difference in the world. In fact, I think some trials are so, so big that the sovereignty of God is the only thing that makes them bearable. The sovereignty of God is what we would call today, that is the game changer. That is the deal breaker. That is what makes the difference, to know that nothing is out of God's control. He is in control of everything that comes into our lives. Listen to a few of these quotes. Jerry says this in the book, in the book Confidence in the sovereignty of God in all that affects us is crucial to our trusting him. If there is one single event in all of the universe that can occur outside of God's sovereign control, then we cannot trust him. Alan Redpath said this, there is nothing, no circumstance, no trouble, no testing that can ever touch me until it has first of all gone past God and past Christ right through to me. If it has come that far, it has come with a great purpose, which I may not understand at the moment. But as I refuse to become panicky, as I lift up my eyes to him and accept this as coming from the throne of God for some great purpose of blessing to my own heart, no sorrow will ever disturb me. No trial will ever disarm me. No circumstance will ever cause me to fret. 
One more. This is by a lady named Margaret Clarkson. She said, the sovereignty of God is the one impregnable rock to which the suffering human heart must cling. The circumstances surrounding our lives are no accident. They may be the work of evil, but that evil is held firmly within the mighty hand of a sovereign God, and all evil is subject to him, and evil cannot touch his children unless he permits it. One of my favorite scriptures, you know, people ask, you know, what is your life verse? Well, I have like a hundred life verses, so this is just one of them. Um, Psalm 31, verses 14 and 15, and it's where it says, as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. And I cannot tell you how many times in my life I have had to remind myself that my times are in his hand and your times are in his hand. Everything about your life, your joys, your sorrows, your trials are all held firmly within his hand. Another word for sovereignty is the old-fashioned word providence. Jerry Bridges defines it like this. God's providence is his constant care for and his absolute rule over all of his creation for his own glory and for the good of his people. Now, that statement shows us there is a twofold purpose in God's sovereignty. <clears throat> it is this. Everything that God accomplishes is not only for his own glory first, but it is also for the good of his people. And in his miraculous way, he accomplishes both of those things simultaneously. <clears throat> Sorry. Let me be honest. Okay, this is true confessions. I tend to be what I call an if-only kind of person. And uh, many years ago, another discussion with my husband, I was confessing this to him. Um, I am the type of person that I do something, I make a decision, and then I begin to second guess it. And sometimes I would second guess it for weeks, months. I would be saying, oh, if only I hadn't done that, okay? If only I hadn't said that. If only he hadn't done that or said that. And I would just go on and on with this. Um, now I'm better about it, okay? I, I do it, but I only do it, for a, I do it for a shorter time, okay? So I'm learning, okay, maybe a few days instead of months, okay? Uh, I'm working on it. Um, but when I was talking to my husband, he was very helpful, and he said, Pam, don't you believe that God is big enough and powerful enough, enough that he could have changed what you said or what you thought or what you did? Couldn't he have changed that? And I went, that's a very good point. Okay, yes, I do. I know he's big enough to have changed that thing I'm second guessing. And that discussion led to something called the three questions, okay? And if you, if you don't get anything else I say this weekend, please get this, okay? I want you to write this down. The three questions, here they are. First question, could God have stopped it? Okay, and in parentheses, I want you to put Yes. Okay. Of course he could have stopped it. God is sovereign. He can do anything he wants. Question number two, uh, in Texas we would call this the kicker. Here's the kicker. Did God stop it? And put no. Did God stop it? No, because I'm in the middle of it. He didn't stop it. I'm dealing with it right now. The third question is, what is he teaching me? You could also say, why not? 
He could have stopped it. He could have stopped what happened, but he chose not to. Could God have stopped it? Yes. Did he stop it? No. Why not? I'm telling you, ladies, once you get a hold of the three questions, I'm telling you, it will revolutionize your life. If you will learn to apply that to the situations in your life, okay? It works for big things. It works for little things, you know? Um, you know, you're at the store, and there's one parking lot, I mean, one parking space, you know, left, and somebody whips in right in front of you and takes your parking space, and you go, could God have stopped it? Yes, he could have, absolutely. Uh, did he? No, he didn't. So what is he teaching me? Okay, he's teaching me humility. He's teaching me forgiveness. Um, he's, he, that's what lets you smile and wave at him, okay, because you know the three questions, okay? So, I mean, that's a silly example, but, but that's a small thing. But I'm telling you, when you come to the big trials and tragedies of life, this is a lifesaver because you know God has allowed it for your good and for his glory. So the first truth we must understand is that God is sovereign. What is the second truth that Jerry Bridges says we must understand? We must understand that God is infinite in his wisdom. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Okay, Bridges says, wisdom is the selection of the best end of action and the adoption of the best possible means for the accomplishment of that action. Okay, that's a little bit wordy. Let me simplify that for you. It means that God does what is the best for us, in, and he does it in the best way. Because of his wisdom, he knows what the best way is. Now, what is the best end of action for the person who knows Christ? We find that in a, uh, Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be what? To be conformed to the image of his son to be more like Christ. That is the best for us. That is our good. Our good is not comfort or happiness or material blessings. None of those things. Our good is conformity to the image of his son. And in his great wisdom, God knows what circumstances both good and bad, are necessary to produce that result. And out of his great love for us, he will do whatever is necessary in our lives to make us more like him. And you know what I am learning in my own life, ladies? God does not always give us what we want. He gives us what we need. And because he created us, he knows what we need far better than we do, and so we must learn to trust him. I love Johnny Erickson Tata. She's one of my heroes. She's a, just a wonderfully gracious lady. I've heard her speak many times. I've heard her say this, that when she first, for those of you who might not know her, she had a diving accident many, many years ago. She's been a quadriplegic now for over five decades. Um, and she said, when I first had my accident, I was just trying to cope. I mean, she was suicidal at first. She said, I finally got to the point where I could cope with what had happened to me. She said, but you know what? The Lord took me past that, and he eventually helped me to accept it, to just accept it as his will for my life. She says, you know what, ladies? He took me past that to where I have embraced it as being best for my life. So I would not change it if I could. 
That is an astounding comment. So that is where we want to get to, that we are trusting that God, in his great wisdom, is doing whatever it takes to make us more like his son. And how does he do this? He, the Holy Spirit in our hearts changes us through the word of God. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you the only original illustration I have ever come up with, and probably the only one I'll ever get. I mean, when you hear a, a preacher give an illustration, I promise 99% of the time he got it from another guy or he got it from a book, okay? But this one, Scout's Honor, this is mine, okay? I didn't steal this from anybody. Uh, many years ago, I was in Texas. I'm washing dishes, okay? And we love Italian food. Uh, you know, if it ends in a vowel, it must be good. You know, pizza, lasagna, spaghetti, okay, it's always good. Um, so I had made some lasagna, and you know how it is with lasagna. You got a big pan, and by the time you get it all cooked all the way through, the edges are kind of crusty, right? Okay, um, kind of crusty and brown, but it's fine. You eat it, you eat half of it, you stick it in the fridge, you take it out a couple of nights later, and if you're lazy like me, you just stick it in the oven and warm it up. Okay. Then you take it out, um, and you eat it, and it's great. But what happened to that first end, okay, that was kind of empty? And by the time you warm, you, you know, warm it up again, it's all black, right? All those noodles and the cheese on this end, it's all black, and it's baked on that pan. And so I've, you know, got this messy pan. So I'm cleaning, I'm washing this pan, and... You know, I don't know why. I don't know what made me think of this. But I thought, you know what? I have two ways to clean this pan. I can take a knife, get a butter knife, and just start scraping, scraping those noodles and the cheese and all that. And I get it clean. But what happens to my pan? Okay, I've got scratches and scars on my pan. But it's clean, all right? So that's one way. What is the other way, all of you wonderful homemakers out there? You pour water in it, right? You get your uh, hot water in your little dove or whatever you use, and you squirt soak in there, and you let it soak, okay, for a few hours or overnight. And then you come back later on, and you don't have to scrape at all. You just take one of those little orange puffy things, and you just kind of do that, and it comes clean. Okay, so I'm cleaning this pan. And so I begin to think in the Bible how water is used as a symbol, is used to represent spiritual cleansing. And how does it say that cleansing takes place through the word of God? Okay, in Ephesians 5.26, it's talking about Christ and the church. And it says, Christ sanctifies the church and he cleanses her with the word. Uh, there's another scripture in John chapter 15. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. And he says, you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So the word has power. It has the power to make us clean. And so I'm just, I'm washing this pan and I keep thinking about it. And it suddenly hits me. I am just like this pan, and I have all sorts of stuff baked on my pan. I have sinful attitudes and habits and actions, and it's, it's on there. It's black, okay? And I need to be taking in the water of the Word, just constantly pouring that water into my life and into my mind and my heart, and I need to just let it roll around that pan. And then just like that, it, it softens it, okay? And so God can just come back and just a little pressure, and he gets me clean. But sadly, ladies, we do not always respond to God's word like we should. We're not teachable. And I think in those cases, the Lord, in his great wisdom, he takes out his knife, and he begins to scrape. And I'm telling you, I can look 
on my life, and I can look back on a few of those scratches and scars, and I know exactly what he was doing. And I'm sorry that I did not respond to the word as I should have. And, you know, it's a hard to admit thing, but sometimes we need suffering. We need adversity in our lives because we're sinful. We're sinful creatures. Uh, you know, that old hymn uh, where it talks about prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We do love God, but we are still prone to wander at times. And I have found in my own life that real lasting change is often hammered out in the midst of great trials, great suffering. And I will tell you, these are the lessons that you never forget. But I'm telling you also from experience that that is the harder path. And as we grow spiritually, we need to learn to be broken by God's word so he doesn't need to bring things into our lives to break us. So we see in the Bible that God, in his wisdom, often uses trials and adversity to accomplish his purposes. Psalm 119 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Now, that last verse will always be near and dear to my heart. Um, as you know, I have four kids. And in between number two and number three, um, I, we had two little kids, and I got pregnant. And we were actually preparing to move at that point from Texas to California. So we were excited. It was kind of a surprise, but okay, another child. And so I remember I was about three and a half months along, went for my OB checkup. I had my two little kids with me. I, I didn't normally take them with me, but this was just going to be a quick visit, uh, stop by the OB, and then go to, you know, my, my mother's house. So we were going to have a visit with Grandma. So I remember going in, and I remember him checking me, uh, the doctor, and he just said, hmm, uh, I'm not hearing a heartbeat. And we had already heard it, you know, a couple of times, two or three times. And I didn't think anything of it. It's like, oh, you know, it happens. They can't hear it. He said, let's go next door, and I'll check with the ultrasound. So he's doing the ultrasound, and I remember he goes, I'm not seeing a heartbeat. And I remember at that point, I kind of got this cold chill, and I went, oh, okay. So he sent me across the street. I had to you know, take, take my little four-year-old and two-year-old with me, and we're going over to the hospital and have another ultrasound. And I remember uh, telling, telling the ultrasound tech, I said, look, I'm a nurse. Be straight with me. Is the baby gone? I remember she said, yeah, the baby's gone. And I remember walking across the street. You know, I'm trying to be very controlled and, you know, calm. And I remember going back to my doctor's office and sitting there, and I had a little pocket Bible in my purse, and I just pulled it out. And I know you're not supposed to do that, and, you know, put your finger there, but in this case, it was very helpful. And I just opened it up, and literally the first verse that my eye fell on was, I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are right and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. And I was instantly comforted. I knew that was the Lord's word for me. I mean, this was an affliction of a type, but he had done it in faithfulness. And I think that scripture carried me through that whole experience. Ladies, we have to come to the point where we trust God's wisdom. And whether we understand it or not, we believe that what he is doing is best. We have to stop our insatiable demand to know why 
to know the whys of our suffering. It's Isaiah 55, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He is God and we are not. If you are struggling with God's plan right now in your life, if you are struggling to believe that what he's doing is the wisest thing, let me invite you into Job chapter 38. Remember Job, good old Job. I mean, he went through more suffering than I think anyone ever has. And in chapter 31, we find him demanding answers from God. He, was, he wanted to know why, why God had done all these things to him. And God was so patient with Job. But finally, we come to chapter 38, and God's had enough questions. And God says, Job... Let me ask you some questions. And he begins to question Job. And this is such an incredible chapter. He begins to say things like, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I filled the oceans? Where were you when I told the waves how far they could come on the beach where they had to stop. Where were you, Job? Job, do you command the morning? See, the only reason the morning comes is because God commands it. He says, Job, do you know where the light and the darkness live? Where is their home? See, God knows because he created them. He talks about the rain. Job, do you make it rain? I love what he says about the lightning. He says, the lightning, the lightning comes and stands before me and says, where do we go? Where do you want us to strike? You know, ladies, I can guarantee, I'm telling you right now, the lightning does not come to me and ask where to strike. And it doesn't come to you, but it does to God. Our amazing, infinite, mighty God runs this entire universe. And yet I have the audacity to come to him and tell him I don't like the way he's running my life. I need Job 38, and I go back to it on a pretty regular basis It reminds me that he is God and I am not. It reminds me how infinite he is and how small I am. And when you ponder Job 38, I guarantee there is no reasonable response but just to fall at his feet and worship. And so in the end, we must learn to trust God more than the ability to understand his ways to understand what he's doing. God does not answer all of our questions because I think if he did, we would not even be able to understand his answers. We simply have to trust that he's doing what's best. So the Bible states very clearly that God uses suffering in our lives. It's very clear about the benefits of our trials. Uh, I've given you a number of scriptures. Please look those up. Uh, This lesson especially has a ton of scripture. I've given you so many things in the appendix that I want you to take time and read over. Um, Trials, they show us what's in our hearts. They humble us. Just, they teach us so much. The last scripture there, Philippians 3.10, says, this is Paul speaking in Philippians. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I have to comment quickly on that last scripture. Uh, Ten words or less. This is definitely a story for a different day, but the first five years of our marriage with my husband were a total nightmare, okay? When we got married, I thought he was a Christian. I think he thought he was a Christian, but it became very clear very quickly that he was not truly a believer. And we embarked on five very miserable years. And I'm not uh, exaggerating when I say many marriages would not have survived. 
And I was driven during those years by my suffering to desperately want to know God. I mean, I was brought up in the church my whole life, and I realized that I knew a great deal about God, but I didn't know God. And somewhere in there, I found that scripture, Philippians 3.10, and I used to read that over and over, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I would just read that over and over and go, what does that mean? What does it mean to know God? Another scripture that someone gave to me was 1 Peter 3, about how to live with an unsaved husband. And I didn't know much, but I knew it talks in those verses about a quiet spirit being a meek and quiet spirit, being precious in the sight of God. And I knew I wanted, wanted that. And those two scriptures took me through that time. And during those years, I began to pray, and I clung to the Word and to God as I had never needed to before. And if you had come to me during those years and said, Pam, someday you will thank God for these years, I would have told you, you are crazy. I will never thank God for this. This is a nightmare. But, you know, I, these many, many years later, I do thank God for that time. Not for the sin, not for what is wrong, but for what God did through that. At the end of those years, he finally, in his perfect time, brought my husband to Christ. He humbled him, showed him his heart, and he came to Christ. For me, I always say he was bringing us both to the end of our respective ropes. For me, he was just teaching me to go to the Word and go to God. And, you know, I never could have known what he was doing. At that point, my husband was a pharmacist. He was not a pastor. That would not come till several years later. But, you know, through the years, we have now, through the last 30 years of ministry, we have had the opportunity to do so much marriage counseling, and we have people sitting in our office, and we can talk to them about starting over with your marriage. We can talk to them about forgiveness and commitment, and it's not something I read in a book, okay? It's something that I lived through, and God show, showed me how he can revive a marriage, and you know, he knew that. I never could have known that. I never would have known my husband was going to be a pastor someday. So many times God is doing things that we simply cannot know. So again, I thank God for that time, even though I didn't understand at the time what he was doing. Job says that his suffering enabled him to understand more deeply who God was. Job 42, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now... My eye sees you. The bottom line, ladies, we don't need to know why. We just need to know God. There are many things that only suffering can teach us. Sorrow is the great teacher. There is not much depth to those who go through life without suffering or trial. It makes a man seek after truth. That is a quote from a pastor from long, long ago. So, Lord, we need to, we beseech you to help us see that our trials are for our good. What are some of the benefits? Dependence on God, perseverance, empathy, and compassion for others who are suffering, an eternal focus, and mainly a deepening of our relationship with God. How do we respond to our trials? We humble ourselves. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We may not think we're proud, but you know what form pride takes in our suffering? It's in the thought that we don't deserve what we're getting. Um, Ladies, what we deserve... Let's think about what we deserve. We deserve death. We deserve eternal punishment. That's what we deserve. And anger at God for what's happening in our lives actually reveals pride. We must humble ourselves and accept his trials as well as 
blessings. So we humble ourselves. Another thing we do in trials is run to the Lord. We run to his word. King David tells us over and over and over in the Psalms to run to the Lord. Wait on the Lord. He shall strengthen your heart. Cry to him when your heart is overwhelmed. Trust in him. Pour out your heart before him. David tells us over and over to run to the Lord. Why? Because he is our refuge. We see so many pictures of God in the Psalms. He is our shelter, our strength, our shield, our rock, our strong tower. He's our fortress, our stronghold, our deliverer. But my favorite picture in the Psalms Psalms is the refuge. He is the refuge. Psalm 57.1, be merciful to God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. Where does the world go when they're suffering? The world has no answers. They go to drugs and psychology and the latest fad. They go to um, Oprah and Dr. Phil. You know, they go all sorts of places. But we don't go there. Okay, we are God's children and we go to him. Elizabeth Elliot, I know many of you are familiar with her. She's also one of my heroes. And I've heard her speak many times before. She's with the Lord now. And I've heard her say, how would I ever have known that God was my refuge if I had never needed one? That's how he teaches us that he is the refuge. He puts us in positions where we need a refuge. So in suffering, we run to him. We focus our mind on the things that are eternal. We focus our minds on the things we cannot see, and our afflictions will become light. That's what we're told in 2 Corinthians 4. So God is completely sovereign. God is infinite in wis- wisdom. Lastly, he is perfect in love. He has loved us with an everlasting love. And in this area of God's love, Again, I think this is one of the main things you've got to understand. If you are angry at God, and and we don't want to admit that. Sometimes it's very deep down because we don't like to say that. We love God, but sometimes we fight anger at him for what has happened. I'm telling you, the real problem is not that you're angry. That is, the anger is just a symptom. The real problem is that you don't truly, really understand how much God loves you. Because when we understand how much he loves us, we would never be angry at him because we know he's doing it for our good and he's doing it because he loves us. We have to be careful. We do not forget God's love for us or become resentful or bitter about what happens in our lives And our thinking right here is so important because our thinking determines our emotions. Our thinking determines our behavior. Very briefly, let me uh, tell you about my dad. My dad was a college professor in in Houston where I grew up. Um, He was a wonderful college teacher. Uh, He, um, yes, very quiet wise man. And he used to teach a lot at our little Baptist church. But for some reason, whenever he wouldn't be teaching, he would sneak off to the church nursery. He liked to go down there and find the little kid that was acting up for the morning. You know how there's one little kid that's crying and they make everybody else cry? Okay, that kid. (laughs) Um, He would get that little kid and he would sit down and play with them or he would go sit out in the rocking chair And, yeah, uh, it was a little folk tale around our church. You know, they say, ooh, did you see that Dr. White was in the nursery this morning? And that was just my dad, all right? But I I have never seen my dad rock my children. He's never rocked any of them. He never even saw them. He went to be with the Lord about two years before my oldest child was born. 
And through the years, there have been some hard moments. Um, as I watched my father-in-law, who thankfully was also a wonderful Christian man, watched him hold my newborns, play with my toddlers, and know my children as they grew up. And I have had to wrestle with that. And, you know, our, our reason cries out, and it says, how? How is this best? How is it best that my dad would never know the joy of his grandchildren? How is it best that my children would not know their godly grandfather? And you know what my answer is to that? I don't know. It makes no sense to me. But I will tell you this, that with all my heart, I believe it was best. Because he always does what is best for his children. And so we have to be careful that we do not look to our circumstance whatever it may be, for proof of God's love. This is, again, a sinful, fallen, broken world. And so we don't look to that. We look to the cross. We look to what Christ did for us on the cross. And again, that is a picture of love that will never dim. That is the ultimate love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that is we, where we see proof of God's love. So in, when we are in trials, don't focus on your problems. The key is to stop focusing on your problems and focus on God. Focus on his great love for us. Let me, let me give you a clue. If you want to be miserable, absolutely miserable, focus on yourself, okay? Uh, think about all the things in your life that you don't like. Think about all the problems with your husband, with your kids, with your job, with where you live. Just think about that for a little bit. And in a very short while, you will be miserable. It works every time. Okay, it is foolproof. And I know that by experience. But yes, but if you want to have joy, focus on the Lord. Focus on his love. For you and focus on his sovereignty, that he's got it under control. He knows what he's doing. So, yes, what we've been talking about, God is trustworthy. What is the second key issue as we wrap up? And that is, remember that other question, can I trust God? Do I have the kind of you know, relationship with God that I know he is with me? So, how do we develop a relationship with God that will help us to trust God more? First of all, I must study. I must study God's word. Proverbs 22 says this, incline your ear and hear the words of the wise, talking about God's word. Apply your heart to my knowledge, for it's pleasant if you keep them within you. Let them be fixed upon your lips so that your trust may be in the Lord. Now, I had read that scripture many, many times until I was reading it one day, and those words jumped out at me, so that. Why do we study God's word? Just to be smart? Just to have Bible knowledge? No, it tells you in Proverbs 22, so that you will trust the Lord more. As you get into his word and you get to know God more, you will trust him more, all right? That's the purpose of Bible study. We store up truth in our hearts so it is there when we need it. Um, you can do it, you know, kind of a cram course. When you're in the middle of the trial, yeah, you can try and cram a bunch of scripture in. It's better if you're putting it in all the time, okay? Just taking it in so it's there when you need it. I had a Bible teacher many years ago, and he liked to say this. He would hold up his Bible and he'd say, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who's not, okay? So we want to have Bibles that are falling apart because we're studying so much. We study 
the attributes of God. Read books all about God, about his attributes. Read the word, study the word, listen to the word, memorize the word. And it helps you, again, just to study God, study his character and his perfections. That helps you to have a high view of God. And that is important because problems are relative. I have found that people that really struggle with fear tend to have a very low view of God. When you have a high view of God, your problems become much smaller. So we must study, we must pray. That goes without saying, go to the Lord, run to the Lord. I must choose. I choose to trust. Many people in the Bible we see chose to trust God. I, you see David in all those Psalms where he's panicking at the beginning of the Psalm by the end. He's praising, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. And you go, what happened between verse 1 and the end? He chose to trust God, okay? Um, Luke 1, Luke chapter 1, we see Mary, when the, uh, the mother of Jesus, when the angel had come to her and told her what was going to happen in her life. I love what Mary says. She just completely threw herself upon God, and she said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. Be it done to me according to your word. She said, Whatever. You know, the prophet Habakkuk, in the end of the book of Habakkuk, made this choice where he says, though the fig tree doesn't blossom, there's no fruit on the vines, there's no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. That means whatever happens. I mean, again, in this day and time, if I don't have any cattle in my stalls, not really a big deal to me. I've never had cattle in my stalls. But for him, that was huge. The, the country was about to be destroyed. You know, for us, it may be something else. It may be, though I get a deadly disease, though I never get married, though I never have children, though I lose my husband, though I lose a child. This whatever is the worst thing you can think of, yet I will, yet I will exult, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. We make the choice. Trusting God is not a matter of our feelings. It is a matter of our will. We can choose to trust him even when we don't feel like it. You know, I've discovered this. We think our problems are all about our problems. My problem is a person, a situation, a job. But you know, it's not that at all. Every problem comes back down to this. It comes back down to our relationship with Christ. Is knowing Christ enough to sustain me in this trial? Can I be content even if nothing ever changes? Is Christ enough for me? And that's a question we all have to ask ourselves. I've heard Elizabeth Elliot say that, that in every trial she ever went through, she always heard the Lord asking her the same question. Will you trust me? And he does the same thing with us. In every trial, he's saying, will you trust me in this? When we choose to trust God, what are the results? It, first of all, it honors God. It shows the world we have a God worth trusting. For us, it gives us joy. It gives us peace of heart as we rest in him. So I think, ladies, we have to sum it up. The key to trusting God is learning to give everything to him, all that we are, all that we have, and especially the things that are the most precious to us. So as I close, just a few more minutes, I have to say one last word about our children precious little sinners that they are, okay? We love our children. And that has absolutely, I think, been my main struggle through my lives. I found men, they worry about money, okay? I, I don't worry, you know, we haven't starved yet. We're going to be okay. But my kids, okay, we 
worry about our kids. Now, worry is a sin, so we say we're concerned about our kids. <laughs> but no, we worry about our kids, yes. Um, so just real quick, a few words about our kids. Many, many years ago, we were in Texas, in a church in Texas, and there was a man that came every year to do a Bible conference. His name was Dr. Stepp. And he was talking one night about the story of Abraham and Isaac, how Abraham, God told Abraham to take Isaac and sacrifice him, okay? Now, Isaac, the son of his old age, I promise you, Isaac was so precious to Abraham. That was probably the most precious thing in his life, and God was telling him to take Isaac and kill him. And Dr. Stepp was teaching, and he said, for years, I couldn't understand this. Why would God tell Abraham to kill Isaac when they had waited so long? This was the son of the promise. Why would he tell him to kill him? And he said, finally, the, the Lord showed me. God never intended for Isaac to die. Isaac wanted Abraham to die. And when Abraham took that knife to kill his precious son, something in Abraham died. And Abraham was never the same again. Because then Abraham knew that Isaac belonged to God. And God gave Abraham back his Isaac. He provided the, the ram in its place. But again, Abraham knew from then on Isaac doesn't belong to me. And so Dr. Stepp continued on. He said, I was going through a really hard time in my ministry. I was a 1,000 miles away from home, and I woke up in the middle of the night just with this premonition that something was wrong. He had four sons, and he said, I fell on my, my knees by the bed. I began to pray to God, and I said, God, please take care of my family till I get home. I'll be home in three days. Just take care of my family until I get home. And he said, I heard the Lord in my mind just say, and John, who's going to take care of them after you get home? You can't take care of your kids when you're right there with them. Why don't you just give them to me? Now, I was a young mom. We had one child. Our oldest child was probably one year old then. So I'm a parent. I don't know much. But I had enough sense to know I was hearing something profound. And about 10 years later, we had moved to California. And by then, we had two children. And about 10 years later, those words came back to me. My seven-year-old son went to sleep one night, woke up 30 minutes later with a grand mal seizure that lasted seven or eight minutes, seemed like seven or eight hours. We grabbed him up, jumped in the car. We had no idea what was happening, rushed to the hospital. He finally, the seizure stopped on the way. He went completely lifeless. We honestly thought that he had died. Got to the, the uh, hospital he woke up finally. Uh, he was temporarily paralyzed. He was temporarily blinded. Um, it was not a night I ever care to live through again. I mean, I'm a nurse. I've seen stuff like that. But this was my seven-year-old son. And the overwhelming emotion of that night was utter, complete helplessness. I remember Carrie holding him in his arms, and we could do nothing, nothing to stop what was happening. And I heard those words. You can't take care of your kids when you're right there with them. Why don't you give them to me? And so, ladies, if you're a mom, you have to to understand our children belong to God. Now, if you saw my son today, he ended up actually being on medicine for several years. He eventually grew out of what caused that. So God was very merciful 
Um, if you saw him today, he's, he's actually a nurse. He's way taller than I am. But I had a lesson to learn that night. Tozer, I've given you that quote in your, in your syllabus where he says that we must give what is precious to us to the Lord. Everything is safe that we commit to him, and nothing is really safe that isn't. Our children belong to God, and we are only stewards. Their times are also in our hands. So the real tr- key to trusting God is total surrender, total surrender. Very quickly, the last little story. Uh, I had my last child when I was six months uh, shy of 40, Okay, I don't actually recommend that, uh, but God is sovereign. It was the perfect time, and it was a hard pregnancy. Being pregnant at 39 was a whole lot harder than being pregnant at 29. Very difficult pregnancy. I was sick um, a lot during it, and to crown it all off, um, when I was about six months along, we had the Northridge earthquake in California. You were there, and probably some of the rest of you. That was a lot of fun. Okay. Um, some, yeah, that was quite an experience. I'm six months pregnant. I got sick uh, again with something, and my doctor was afraid I had gotten uh, a hold of some, some contaminated water. All the pipes had broken in the ground, and we had to keep getting bottled water. So I go in. He does the test. That test, that lab test took two weeks to come back. He was afraid I had something called toxoplasmosis, which is not a big deal, except when you're pregnant. And it can cause severe birth defects, blindness, deafness, some other things. And it took two weeks to go, to come back, the longest two weeks probably of my life. And I remember one night while I was waiting, I was all alone in our little office, and the Lord just broke my heart. It had been a rough pregnancy already, and this was just kind of the end. And I remember he brought me to a point of surrender I had never come to before, of just giving up. It's like, okay, I just, I give up. Whatever you want to do is fine. And I remember I began to pray, and just one by one, I gave my husband, we had three other children by that time, gave my children one by one, And I gave that little baby to the Lord. I just said, they're yours. Whatever you want to do is fine. If you want this baby to have some issues, just give me the grace. Give me the grace to deal with that. And, you know, those prayers were, it's not easy. And they were said with many tears. But I do remember after I finally stopped praying, I had this just unexplainable sense of relief, of peace, of just, I mean, they had always been his, but I think for the very first time, I acknowledged it. I gave all, I gave gave up my demands for a happy, healthy life, happy, healthy children, no problems, everything go well. And I just said, whatever, Lord. I remember I wrote a letter. I told you, Elizabeth Elliot's one of my heroes. I wrote her a letter because I'd heard her talk on total surrender. And she wrote back, she said, how well I identify with your misgivings about the child you now carry. What mother doesn't admit having had such thoughts from time to time? The test comes to us not just once, but again and again. But as you've discovered, total surrender is the key to true spiritual freedom. Here I am at 67, having lost two husbands and quite a few material possessions, yet I'm still sorely tempted to worry about my grandchildren and the world they must grow up in. I have to say, that was such an encouragement. Now, she didn't say she worried. She said she was tempted to worry. But even Elizabeth Elliot was (laughs) tempted to worry. So that was a great encouragement to me. But anyway, she said, but giving them daily to the Lord does bring comfort. So this brings us to prayer. Prayer is so important here, ladies. Pray for your children. I have given you in the appendix in the back suggested prayers for your children. If you don't have some sort of prayer notebook 
where you can jot down your prayers for your children, please do that. Give them their own little section, jot down what you're praying, and someday when they leave home, when they get married, give them those pages. Okay, give them all the prayers that you have prayed for them. It'll be like a diary of their life, things they won't even remember as seen through the eyes of a praying mother. I've given you a poem by Amy Carmichael called For Our Children. Uh, You'll have to read it on your own because I cry whenever I read it, but it tells us to pray for our children. Now, again, the Lord was so merciful to me when that lab test came back. It was negative, and a few months later, my little Catherine was born healthy and normal. But again, the Lord had something to teach me. Ladies, we have to give everything to God. There is no other choice if we want to know peace. Like Peter said in John chapter 6, when the Lord asked them if they would go away, he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? There is no one to go to but you. You have the words of eternal life. I love the hymn, Be Thou My Vision. The last verse says, Heart of my own heart, whatever befall. That is total surrender. Whatever befall, no matter what comes, we will trust him. Here is the last scripture. 1 Peter 4.19 says, Let those who suffer according to the will of God, all of our suffering is according to the will of God, Let them entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. When you are in the midst of suffering, that is your game plan. 1 Peter 4.19, we understand our suffering is according to the will of God. We entrust our souls to our creator, and we continue to do what is right. Uh, Where do we find that? In the word. We find what is right to do. Elizabeth Elliot always talked about doing the next thing. Just do the next thing. Go cook the meal. Go iron the shirt. Just do the next thing and continue to trust God. So my prayer for you, each one of you, and for me, is that we would come to know God better and that we would learn to trust him more in the midst of our suffering and that we would live lives that bring glory to him. Let's pray. Father, how we need your help in this area. We struggle. We fall. Lord, we we desperately need your help to help us trust you more. We are frail. We are faulty. And things come into our lives that sometimes threaten to overwhelm us. But Lord, you are there. And we know that you are working all things for your glory and our good. I pray for every lady here. I cannot know the situations, but you know every one. So minister your word to her heart. Give her encouragement and give her hope. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for this time just to come together and study your word. Give us a good time of fellowship and just... Take care of us as we go through the rest of the day. In your precious name, amen.